Okay, recording started. Welcome to the 12th OBI webinar. This is about collaborative literacy. This is OBI, the Open Building Institute, uh, making affordable ecological housing widely accessible. Today we're going to talk about the the collaboration process itself. How do you get a lot of people to collaborate in a massively transformative project? Our focus is large, significant projects that make an impact on the world. So with that, I'm going to start on the presentation. I'm going to screen share. Make sure I start that. Sharing my screen and going into the presentation. Present mode. Okay. So, Open Building Institute, as far as this 12th webinar, this will be the, the last one for a few months. We're going to take a little break, but we're going to come back to this in a few months after we have all the utilities done and some much more significant progress on the CD Eco Home and other uh, projects here. So, uh, let's start this, this presentation. So, free and open source software has catalyzed the growth of open hardware and... Currently, open hardware is beginning to gain traction in mainstream economics, such as two good examples are 3D printing and uh, open scientific hardware. And in this, in this webinar, we explore the ways, how, how uh, literally the ins, ins and outs, what we've learned over the last decade or so since the OSE began. Um, like, what are the principles and tools for effective, focused crowd collaboration? Who can do it? What motivates volunteers? What are the limits to the potential effect of such a of, a, of an open collaborative process that's um, crowdfunded? Even uh, what's how how well can it scale, and how can we have widespread adoption into the current status quo of, of proprietary research and development? So these are the learnings over the last decade, and are currently culminating in a massively collaborative project, the Open Building Institute, which builds upon all of OSC's work. And it's, it's a perfect example of what large collaboration can do in the sense that a house is a very complex project. It requires so many moving parts and it requires a large effort to make it happen. So we build upon OSC, OSC's machines and build houses like this is our last eco home. This is 2016, the seed eco home. And the next plan is to build another second prototype in 2017 about about October now in 2016 we built the structure it took five days for the main structure with a team of about 50 people and took another five days for the greenhouse with another uh, team of 50 people a lot of them those about half the same people from the last workshop now um, we're very ambitious so what can we do next time I mean one one thought on a table is doing a, a house that's not as large as this this one was 1400 square feet uh, something may be two-thirds the floor space, but what if we do, say, the house and the greenhouse in five days? Now, that would double. That would be pretty pretty radical. Um, one way to go about that is to focus on smaller, cheaper, better, faster, based on all the lessons. But that's how we think. We think about always uh, breaking the limits of what we have. This is our aquaponics. How can we feed people? Okay, so let's talk about collaborative literacy. So literacy. So collaborative is self-explanatory, but what's what's collaborative literacy? I mean, collaborative literacy is literally a, literally a literacy, just like writing or using a computer. It's a set of skills that allows for true and open cooperation in a digital age. How does this come about? Why is this relevant today? Well. Today it's relevant because today's tools from communication to computers to ever increasing technology that allows you to produce things on a micro scale that used to take whole factories to do. This allows literally today anyone's ambitions to match execution. I mean, that, that is possible today. Like, not that everyone's going to do it, but it's possible. Today we do have the tools available, tools that... 50 years ago, you know, th maybe even 30 years ago were not available and certainly not available in the last de last century uh, or say last century, uh, say 100 years ago. Uh, so so we can be filled with great optimism. It's a case for abundance or post scarcity. We talk about post scarcity, uh, transcending the world's artificial scarcity in terms of the material base, meaning essentially the entire economy 
um, transcending that by open source design, by open products, lowering the barriers to entry. So how about if we solve all the world's problems and leave nobody behind? Well, that's the case that we, we are trying to make. We talk about post-scarcity. People like Peter Diamandis in, their, in his book, Abundance or Bold, talk about their high-tech versions of that. We're focused much more on the ecological integration and, to, and the whole, uh, te both technology and ecology play prominent roles in paying attention to heirloom wisdom, not only the advanced technology that we have today. So uh, what we have to start with, though, is a hard open source hardware economy that's pretty much non-existent. Linux is a major milestone in human history, as in most of the internet runs, the backbone, the, the back-end software is Linux, Apache servers, and other open source programs that make the internet run, or Android, or that's open, so soft, open source software. We, a lot of people know that, are very well aware of it. Open hardware, on the other hand, is one billionth of the existing economy. To, currently, it's about $100 million dollars of a market compared to the overall globe that's worldwide compared to a global a hundred trillion for the overall economy so what are we comparing open development or open collaborative development or collaborative literacy to well we're comparing it to to current proprietary development where people go off into silos work individually on products a lot of times reinvent the wheel they protect what they have they file patents they work in secrecy and that could indicate a lot of the wheel is ends up being reinvented. Um, lots of competitive waste, so to say. Personally, my first introduction to such competitive waste was in grad school when um, we had some hot material. And when I was back in a PhD fusion program, uh, I actually couldn't talk openly to other groups because of fear that they would take our ideas and publish them. Now, that's pretty crazy if you think about it, because even in, in today's academia, places that are known for sh supposedly sharing knowledge, that doesn't happen. So uh, thinking deeply about that, about a decade ago, over a decade now, uh, I came up with open source ecology as, a, as an open platform for true collaboration between stakeholders. So the current trends in open hardware are positive, though, because 3D printing is, that's one example of... Um, open hardware because the 3D printing world is pretty much filled with open design. The, the open source RepRap project is pretty much responsible for creating the entire consumer 3D printer industry. The largest companies in the world are based on this open source project. Um, great example of a vibrant project that's pretty much popularized 3D printing. Everyone now can build their own 3D printer or, or get a kit or something. Uh, very low cost, like $300 as compared to like $10,000, you know, say a decade ago when uh, prior to the open source project. Another great case is, and this is just a paper that came out yesterday um, by Joshua Pierce from Michigan Tech University about emerging business model for open business models for open source hardware. He's mentioned particularly the case of open source scientific equipment where um, things like uh, var various equipment can get you 90 to 99 percent cost savings while retaining the high quality of the product so so things like for example optical mounts for laser systems various little syringes and probes and and measurement devices that would be otherwise much more expensive or much more accessible uh, in the open source and that's a good example of a you know high-tech kind of advanced uh, equipment largely electronics a uh, perfect case for 3d printing and open electronics to make make um, prices go way down and accessibility to low-cost lab uh, labs much more uh, widespread so this is uh, this was published in the journal of open hardware uh, which is also a new publication so there's definitely motion on the open hardware front this is largely by joshua pierce uh, he's our hero in the open source movement, and that's a book he published about open source lab equipment here that you can see. But let's, um, okay, so now let's talk about um, the possibilities, because we talked about, okay, project like OSC, OBI, any ambitious project that, that's really a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal, like I talked about in the TED Talk, 
uh, requires huge resources that we don't have. So what resources do you need to have? Well, it turns out that in today's world of capability, money is not the issue. So in our own history, we've, we've applied crowdfunding, crowd design. Uh, we haven't actually used incentive challenges, but you know, the first in 2011, we did the Global Village Construction Set Kickstarter, raised $68,000 or $64,000 there. Platforms like GrabCAD are public platforms where you submit a design challenge, say for some mechanical device, for some machine, and a bunch of people um, work on that to produce the best design. Uh, and you can pay them. There's That's an incentive kind of a platform. But crowd design, you can out crowdsource things for free or for pay. XPRIZE is perhaps... Um, okay, so XPRIZE is an example of an incentive challenge where where some people raise money to like millions on a scale of millions now to fund some big hairy audacious project like the hundred mile per gallon car or the first commercial space flight or whatever um, but that that definitely fosters the the development by by the masses now what about when we're talking open source crowdsource development project like OSC uh, if you combine all these three elements, you get a, a method of development that totally transcends the money issue here. So combine crowdfunding, combine crowd design, combine incentive challenges into a crowdfunded crowd design incentive challenge. What is that? That means you crowdfund the actual reward for a challenge that you draw up, and then people compete for that to get a prize for a well-defined serious ambitious goal so you end up having to put in no money you crowdfund it all you need is your time and big ideas so we have not used hero x to this point but we are actually planning on that um, that to me is the perfect balance of your you've got a big vision you've got crowdfunding that's available and the crowd incentive challenge where tons of people then uh, go after that prize that could be a very effective model uh, for developing on low budget but you still need people let's talk about people um, well uh, I'm inspired on this front because people don't necessarily have to be the issue so um, I have a friend from uh, the Ted Fellows group uh, his name is Jimmy he runs he founded the Rare Genomics Institute and he taught me that he has 164 doctors and professionals volunteering 10 hours per week on his project. Now that's over 40 full-time equivalent volunteers and not just any people off the street we're talking about high-level professionals and doctors. Okay so now when I saw that I'm like okay wow this is amazing uh, we can do the same for OSC because for OSC it's always been um, the challenge well how do you get consistent reliable developers um, and this really solves so we we got onto that in a serious way so right now just basically in uh, February we started recruiting so we were building we uh, were in the process of building a human resources team uh, you can see our human resources badge for people who make it to our human resources team basically people who recruit recruit others to the development effort and we're starting to track the hours right now over uh, a month about a month we've risen from uh, one developer to uh, eight developers right now that's we want to see this rise and exponentiate our goal is to have a significant large-scale effort so we're tracking now the team and the hours the hours here we are requiring 10 hours per week the hours should follow pretty much the development numbers so let's say for eight people there should be about 80 hours um, so we're tracking that actually by people logging their timesheets but yeah that's that the, the hours here are shown hours divided by 10 so the numbers should match up but this is actually I'm gonna put in a plug for OSE developers as we're shifting from ad hoc development to much more concerted effort uh, we are putting a significant effort on the recruiting function because we know that people want to help we know that we need more organization but that's just one of the one of the things we have to do but we are finding people are not the issue it's organization so let's continue so if you want to start a 
a big project and do well in the open source world. Um, if we talk specifically about large ambitious projects, the first requirement is a massive transformative purpose. It's a word I borrow from Peter Diamandis. Um, it's consistent with the kind of exponential organization thinking of OSE. Exponential means that right now we're building a foundation. We've developed a, a lot of work on what open source product development looks like, how that works, and I'll talk about more about that. But pretty much ambitious thinking, 10x, 10 times thinking, or exponential, just huge increase. Um, my recent learnings are that, you know, I guess it's been kind of inherent to the way I think, but, but 10x is much more exciting than 2x. To get something two times as good, you can tweak something here and there, make some linear improvements, but 10 times thinking requires a totally new way of thought. It's, and it excites people. The bottom line is that it excites people. It's got energy, it's got the juice to inspire people, get involved. For OSC, we've got several points like that. We're just gonna end artificial scarcity and end war. We're gonna do mass creation of right livelihood. We're going to do a hundred time resource efficiency increase. How? Well, 10 times by lowering the cost via open source equipment and 10 times by the fact that it's lifetime design, meaning you don't throw it away after 10 years, you maintain it because it's forever serviceable and maintainable by the users. So 10 times 10, you get a hundred times resource efficiency increase. Very p positive things to think about. Very exciting to people. So. Uh, then our next promise is the distributive enterprise idea. That means we don't only publish the designs, but also the business models around whatever we do. So if we're developing the 3D printer right now, which is what we're doing, we're developing a workshop model where you can build 3D printers. For example, uh, 24 people come in to build a 3D printer in a single day using our extreme manufacturing processes. We charge people for the event. People walk away with a working 3D printer. It's great for everybody. Money crosses the table. People gain skills. Everyone is happy. But we publish that. We don't want to monopolize that market. We know that uh, we're working with many billion dollar and larger markets. We're saying, hey, everybody, do this too. This is great. Let's, let's, let's be consistent with OSC's mission of ending war and poverty, creating right livelihoods, amazing uh, ecological improvements and efficiency improvements that's our mission we don't care about giving our stuff away because it's good for the world so the requirement one for any any hairy project is a massive purpose and purpose is the key just like in self-determination theory we have that autonomy mastery and purpose are the true drivers of human motivation if you can provide that to people people will join you and you will have a team and you will walk together in harmony to, to, to do things you've never thought possible. So I'm going to go through more requirements basically of what we've learned over the years regarding open development, massive transformative purpose being number one. Requirement number two, it's modularity. If you've got a complex project like the, the GVCS, the Global Village Construction Set, the this is impossible until you think hard about breaking complexity into bite-sized chunks. That's exactly what we have done, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, if you read the open source product, sorry, the product development literature, because there is no such thing as open source product development literature really yet, but if you look at the industry standard product development literature, and you can see that link on the wiki if you go to the presentation, uh, you will see that in the most cutting-edge papers, people are talking about modularity as absolutely being a key to effective product development. You can break things down into interconnectable parts. You can work in parallel. You can then enlist massive amounts of people to work on bite-sized chunks as long as you know how they fit together. So the good news is that open source product development, the um, mod is the, the future. The literature seems to say that. They say that um, modular open source design is the way that companies are going to migrate to in the future. I hope you can hear me here. We've got rain here. I've got a little sound in the background here, so I'm going to try to speak very clearly. 
So requirement two is modularity. How does it work? For us, we work on 50 machines. We break them down into modules, like a tractor has wheels, an engine, a frame, and other parts, or a backhoe has a, a bucket, a boom, hydraulic cylinders, etc. We break about each, each uh, machine down into 12. We break then each of the 12 modules into a large number, it's about 40, of development elements, critical items like your design, your concept, your 3D CAD, your build instructions, everything else that goes into the development process, your calculations. So you end up with a large number of individual development items for each machine and for each module. Now the trick there is how do you organize a large team to work on that? What follows what? What is strategic to do at what time? When can you begin a step and end another? That's all the kind of questions for process managers, and that's the, the forefront of our development right now, basically asking ourselves what is the, uh, the process by which we can do this effectively, and we're making the road by walking in our current development team with our HR function. We've got a core team of OSE developers, and we've got, uh, we're, we're going to add documenters to the show, IT people. We've got the HR team, human resources in the works. So modularity works. The, the point is if we can then match each of these tasks to a person that human resources gets us because they're in, excited by the massively transformative purpose, then we're golden. The possibility is huge. So the question uh, revolves around how effective is our organization or our transition from vision to execution. So um, we've learned over the years that effectiveness, uh, in our case, requires a shift from ad hoc development to a very focused process. Uh, there are good examples of the ad hoc process. It has succeeded in RepRap, the open source 3D printer project. Over 10 years, they've de at this point have de designed a 3D printer that's the best in the world. In fact, the number one 3D printer in the world is an open source printer. It's the Prusa i3 MK2 original. Uh, that was on the cover of Make Magazine. I believe that's the leading uh, best consumer 3D printer out there. And that's an open source model. Uh, then there's Lulzbot, another great example. Um, but it took 10 years to get an automated machine that includes automatic bed leveling so you don't have to mess with the 3d printer actually being leveled to start a print um, that's the current state of art but it took a bit of time and, and when you actually look at that project very carefully you'll see that it's a bunch of ad hoc contributions a lot you know hundreds of different design paths and roads and many dead ends and so forth uh, it works if you have a huge number of people and, and small enough capital investment that a lot of people can get involved uh, but that may not necessarily work for us, uh, as we're seeing. I'll talk about that. So Wikimedia Foundation and Linux Foundation are well-recognized, multi-billion dollar value projects. And uh, they, however, don't, I mean, they don't necessarily run on volunteers. They do some, but, but their core is um, significant foundations with multi-million dollar budgets, like Wikimedia Foundation, about 30 million. Linux Foundation is about six million dollar budgets. So they have a core team that, that does that. So, so our model could be similar to that. However, um, both the combination of RepRap and Foundation model would not work for a civilization, civilization starter kit project like, like open source ecology. Uh, so for the RepRap side, I must say that there is a much higher level of coordination because we're not de de developing just one one machine like the RepRap, the 3D printer, because that's actually one of our machines, but we have 50 different machines that all fit together. A huge coordinated effort is required for that. It can't be done by ad hoc development because people will be all over the place, and that's actually what we've seen. That's exactly what we've seen over the history of the project. Kind of exploded and kind of uh, went all over the place as, as we lost track of documentation, and now we're really shifting to, to getting the whole thing done. Now, why do I say foundation model would not do it as well? Well, foundations typically aren't in a position to have the kind of long-term thinking or transformative thinking that would fund a, a big project because, for one, it takes too much money. So, so right now, OSC is going to heavyweight product management. That's actually a term that comes from the, the product development literature, but essentially a strong... Um, strong managers that have a good overview of, of the working project and that can lead a large teams of people under tight specifications and requirements 
so it's not kind of a um, a free for all setting it's a well planned well designed uh, situation that can actually get to, to specific goals on a on a specified timeline because we haven't achieved that when first okay so 2011 when I first got onto the TED world stage so much interest came about thousands you know hundreds or thousands of emails and it's like oh yeah it will be done in a second and then I found the difference between vision and execution the difference between what just having an idea versus the structure the team and resources to make something happen because these things don't just happen by themselves like Wikimedia Foundation takes 30 million dollars to write an online ex and to organize not to write to organize the writing of an online encyclopedia and then there's many many people who contribute to the encyclopedia around the world but it takes some structure to do that so that gives gets me to the f fourth requirement of a big hairy audacious goal project and that is bootstrapping simply because it's just too expensive to achieve a typical BHAG big hairy audacious goal it takes a lot of money uh, foundations cannot support this because foundations typically a short have a short stakeholder based view there are systematic issues uh, the the entrenched money in the system is not gonna pay for its own destruction though some people in foundations may may like that may like that but we haven't found anybody uh, that we know of yet who who would support our work in the long term um, crowd develop so so therefore we migrate to crowd develop replicable enterprise models as the only way so what we're saying is that okay we can do one OSC facility like say we're here in Missouri we can build up a facility if that's all we wanted to do say you know like get up to a million bucks or a few million dollars and call it a day that would be great but th but our our mission is much broader than that and as to that is to create a large number of education training production facilities worldwide what we call the OSE campus model um, which would requires require a, probably a million or two per facility so for many of them it would require uh, on the order of a hundred billion dollars I don't think we're gonna find that anytime soon um, so in the meantime we better bootstrap our own way create meaningful replicable enterprise as the way to fund all the all the development facilities and that's how we get people to join us we're saying hey we're developing this model but once we have it it's free free to everybody we can teach you about it we can teach you the effective um, uh, so how to build tools how to organize how to develop teams which is what we're talking about so we're providing all those other support assets so in our process what we've done is I mean we've done things like the true fans we've done a Kickstarter true fans are people who donate ten dollars a month to the project that's still active this graph here ends in 2014 right now uh, we're only at like I haven't paid much attention to the true fans um, uh, to to raise that too much as we had other funding that came in pretty much around the area of of the 2011 TED talk right now we're at about a hundred true fans so still a background operational budget is coming from the true fans but that is no way to do do any planning any expansion uh, unless we get like thousands of true fans like thousand true fans would be ten thousand a month but that's barely enough to hire like a couple of people still you know if we wanted to hire people um, so we got to go much to, to fund a uh, funding levels much greater than simple crowdfunding like that can do but I do recommend it it's awesome if you're starting up like that I mean the true fans have saved me and thank you to all the true fans when I you know by tw 2009 I was a couple years after grad school I had thirty thousand dollars of savings I burnt that all in about two years I had zero money I started crowdfunding and I was golden that was the first time I felt so free in my life like I've never like at never at any time in, in the history of my life because I was doing what I was passionate about and I was getting paid for that and it was minimal like a thousand bucks per month and it went up to like the four thousand dollars per month and that was plenty to get to the world stage to do some great things and then think about well what does it really take to expand this kind of an effort so uh, crowdfunding recommended the true fans model recommended hero X which is the uh, crowdsourced the crowdfunded crowd design challenge 
we want to do that uh, we definitely recommend that and we're going to see how our experience with that goes as we move into the future so bootstrapping in summary we need to pave a way for an unlimited number of replications to happen we're not going to do that through foundations uh, crowdfunding will will help but open source enterprise that provides the cash flow is our current way so just to continue a little bit about the funding here we have a graph of the prototypes built and cost uh, this is for a five-year period basically from the time the first machine was built uh, the red line actually shows the cost per machine like at the very beginning it was like eighteen thousand dollars per for, per machine then it was kept dropping kept dropping then it kind of rose back up again but the number of machines kept rising this is on, until 2013 uh, since then I've, I've lost track right now we're at about 20 or so unique prototypes over a hundred like 120 or so machines built but I kind of lost track here 2011 was when the TED talk happened and um, first replication actually happened in 2012 where then in 2013 all the ones in the red here those are the ones we built at factory farm the different machines but now the green ones are the ones we started s seeing that many other machines were built in other countries so for example in 2013 2012 there are two four six eight ten twelve thirteen machines built not by us but by but by replicators but still i mean we're not scaling in any way virally it's um it's good but nowhere the the viral adoption so, so because we're relying on a voluntary effort but we think the voluntary effort is key because you cannot buy a revolution it would cost too much then the higher purpose attract mi attracts mission alignment and then we just need to select for performance with our human resources team so many people have higher purpose a lot of them might not necessarily have the skill set we want people with both the skill set and the, the and the mission alignment to make things happen but that's uh, I don't believe we would have the money to do this let's just talk a little bit about money for what I've described about the parallel design method 50 machines how many hours of development time does it work does it take it's about 50 million if you pay people 10 bucks per hour to develop the global village construction set 50 machines times 12 modules each 40 development steps uh, times another two because we develop the enterprise steps after that three prototypes each 40 hours per development item gets you 5.8 million development hours that's for minimum viable product three prototypes that are almost ready for mainstream adoption we don't have that money so we rely on volunteers so requirement six if you want to build a, a hairy big hairy project you need a roadmap to attract people you need some planning so there's a any good open source development project will have these guiding documents that that show their mission their roadmap uh, for ourselves you can click on all these links you can v view our 20 year 25 year old 25 year future roadmap you can see our critical path you can see our priorities and how we filter the priorities because we have to make decisions on on where you know what do we do next right now and a budget so if you are running an open source project in order to help your clients your collaborators join and, and invite more of them put up these documents on your website help people see where you're going because if you can tell people where you're going you can take people on that trip if you do not know where you're going a person may not sign up to go to an unknown place next so this is actually talking about budgets here this is our current state and these are our revenue goals uh, based on the distributive enterprise uh, so let's let's explain this this is our budget plan for 2017 from April till February of 2018 April 2017 February 2018 um, so this is the budget requirement you got to have a budget to do things now if you're talking about expanding like we're talking about large expansion to to significant world impact in fact towards the trillion dollar economy within 25 years and of course not by us but all the people that we help along we can we can seed the effort we can generate significant value but then the, the real work is going to be by adopters 
So let's look at this. Right now we have a true fans baseline of $1,000 per month. Um, we're gonna, uh, we're actually putting up, a, we'd like to put up a website for selling swag, like just little things like stickers and, and, and uh, published books and other things. So if you'd like to help with that, actually, that's one of the tasks for the, the enterprise website. Once again, the, all these enterprise assets, including like, for example, um, the sticker, like embed codes for your website. Well, you can put that on your website too if you want to start up an, o, you know, an OSC related project. We're, we're opening up absolutely every economic asset to the world. We're taking leadership on that. We think that is important because if it works for us we'd like it to work for others so okay but here let me let me go back to this here so right now we're in like april uh the first 3d printer workshop our goal is to attract 12 people who pay each 300 dollars per seat to attend the workshop they walk out with a working printer if they pay the extra for the materials so we're selling an education experience our aim is to show that we do $3,600 in that event. We've done that before last year, so we know that's that's doable. And then in June, we are aiming to run the, what you see here as this distributed enterprise baseline is a baseline of about 7,000 per month, which comes from workshops where 24 we attract 24 people. So that's that's our model right now. And the, this large bump of chunk of change here is from producing a few brick presses in a brick press workshop. And the large large milestone here, uh, we're actually looking at by December of 2017, running a big workshop now, ambitious, where we build 100 3D printers in a single day, take an auditorium, take perfected instructionals, perfected machines that are extremely efficient to build. Currently, we've just done the unique part count on our 3D printer. The grand total is 40 parts. Look at D3D on the wiki. Uh, that's a very simple design of a 3D printer made with 40 parts. We have absolutely broken through the complexity barrier. I think this is actually a decent milestone and we're hoping that our uh, 3D printer actually goes viral because it's a construction set. It's not a single 3D printer, it's a construction set. But anyway, um, we are aiming for revenue, significant revenue demonstration that we can do that, that it actually works to get this major productive effort in an extreme manufacturing workshop setting um, but the baseline is 24 3D printers. We think that, that people can replicate it. We think that to run a very effective, well-organized workshop where you build 24 3D printers in a, in a day, that can be a great product. The demand for 3D printers is huge. So that's, that's what we're doing. Th those are our revenue goals. And then once we stabilize this model, uh, we can actually recruit people to run this in multiple locations and so forth while encouraging anyone else to pick up exactly what we're doing and replicated free of charge. Okay, uh, requirement seven. So talking more about the requirements for transformative projects, you gotta have a baseline of critical tools and practices that everyone subscribes to. And this is the literacy part, the collaborative literacy, understanding uh, how the whole open source product development process works. So, so some of the critical tools in open source product development and practices Prat you got to have a platform where you can upload all your designs for immediate access by anyone in the world and that is our wiki right now opensourceecology.org slash wiki there has to be good organization on the platform and we do that by organizing everything by modules and the development template the development template is an item that's got like 40 items on it look at look at that on the on the wiki but we break down everything into those. I believe that's 50 projects times 12 modules. That's like 600 times about 100 steps uh, each, and then multiple. It's like a hundred. It's more than a hundred thousand items that we're tracking just like that on the wiki. How do you do that? Well, you know the machine name. You know the module name based on a list a web page, a wiki page that lists all the modules, and then you've got the development template. So if you know these basic principles of orientation, if you study that maybe for, you know, an hour, study that, you'll be able to find any one of hundreds of thousands of development assets on the wiki. And that's the literacy part. A person has to sit down and understand that there's a logic to the process and to the project. Um, but that kind of logic 
and rules of the game can be established for any project, whether it's OSC or somebody else, to, to, to run projects, amazing large-scale projects that do amazing work. Okay, more on the requirements, on the critical tools. We all keep work logs that show our current work product with a hyperlink. We log our time on a timesheet so we can track how much time we're spending and what we're producing. If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. Hence, the timesheet and the work logs. Naturally, you want to use open tools. Things like FreeCAD, the open source 3D CAD, or Caden Live video editing. You download that for free as open source projects. No barrier to participation. Say some person without any resources, but with an internet connection, wants to collaborate, they can because the tools are free. Um, the other part of, of rapid cloud parallel collaboration is real-time tools such as, I mean, you've got uh, Hangouts, naturally video conferencing or open source versions of that. Um, live crowd editable docs, that's a huge one. Basically documents like Google Slides or open source versions of that which are just coming out as really, really workable competitive alternatives to the Google Docs and we want to transition to that as soon as we can. Um, but so far we've been using Google Docs. Uh, but documents which a number of people can can join online in different parts of the world and they can edit that all of them all of the people like say 10 20 30 100 people edit a single document in real time so if you have good organization within that document you can have many people make meaningful collaborations so that a task that would otherwise be linear linearly done by a hundred steps in series can now be done with a hundred people working in parallel at the same time. So if you've got this down, you got a one hour meeting, a hundred collaboratively literate people, and they do the work of a hundred hours in a single hour. That's the potential. We haven't done that yet. We've, we're not that good yet, but we've done that certainly with a few people. And we're trying to build those numbers up so we can literally do what I just said. A hundred people working on a, on, a, on a development project. And after an hour, so you've got the complete design of something complete. So just, just paralleling using open source, cloud-based, collaborative editing and design. So requirements. Current, another requirement, I also mentioned the modular breakdown. So yeah, the modular breakdown is critical to, to the bite-sized bite chunking of information to, to solvable bite-sized chunks. And then another practice that's really critical for us is the extreme manufacturing model. What we do is spend a lot of time on design and then do builds very rapidly, So which, which then for a, an open hardware project allows many people to work on that project because the you have to recognize that the bulk of the work is actually design. If you have an absolute complete design, absolute complete instructionals and bills of materials and sourcing information, the build, especially when you use digital fabrication between 3D printing, CNC torch table cutting, and other digital fabrication tools, you can then build extremely rapidly and that's that's what we're basing our extreme manufacturing on we build things build heavy machines in a single day and the houses in five days so that's critical that enables the remote collaboration because a lot of people think oh well if i'm not on site i can't collaborate well very far from the truth uh, and that's part of the collaborative literacy your understanding that you do not need to be on site but you can then descend to a site and then do a quick build so by all means, remote collaboration is possible and the digital economy makes it even better and, and easier than before. Because think about this, if you're working with heavy machines, part of the, the prototyping work is danger. Heavy things that can fall on you and kill you. Well, so actually by doing the crowd collaborative design, you're minimizing the time you're spending in a workshop and therefore making the safety aspect much, much better. And that's part of the design. The safety issues are part of the design of the extreme manufacturing model. Okay, uh, going forward with the, the requirements on, so I talked about the, the, the basic critical tools and practices. Now, now I'm going to focus on one aspect, requirement eight, 
which is the free and accessible tools. Free and accessible, so free CAD, 3D CAD, anyone in the world can do it. It's important that it's free because then nobody is prevented from contributing because they don't have a hundred bucks for a CAD license. Critical, critical to enabling anybody um, to do it at low cost. So let me give you another example of why free and open source or accessible tools are important. Like for example, in, in HR and recruiting right now, there's various person like work style profiles that cost money. And just to give a very specific example, the Colby index, K-O-L-B-E. That's like a really advanced index for, for determining how people work, their work style, what they gravitate to, whether they're starters or or detailed oriented researchers or whatever. But anyway, um, it costs say it costs 30 bucks for us to do that. Well, if we're recruiting large num we're going through large numbers of volunteers that may may be recruited for sm even small tasks, it's just it kind of breaks the budget, you know. Uh, so it's important not to put a price on any tool that we use because that will just um, prevent others from using it. Like if it's a piece of intellectual property, uh, like to like software tools or just information, knowledge wants to be free so that we can benefit more people. Uh, that's just how we roll here. And then, of course, this controversy, well, how do you make money? Well, there's many different ways to make money, but the business model has to reflect the open source nature of the product. So, uh, example three of um, low-cost low cost tools, like, for example, a 3D printer, you can build yourself for $300 in parts, and then you can prototype complex objects. Uh, so that technology used to be 10,000 now it's 300 so actually a lot of people can even if they're on our, on our team they don't have too much money well maybe they can save up 300 bucks to get a 3d printer but but it would be much harder you can naturally see if that 3d printer was ten thousand dollars so in the best case scenario tools for co cooperation are free just to remove that barrier completely so that anyone no matter of their financial position can collaborate and requirement number nine, for, that's a part of our platform here. So we're talking about OSC Linux, a, a l distribution of Linux, w which is preloaded with all the common tools that we use, such as FreeCAD, Blender, SketchUp, LibreCAD, Caden Live, many others. But because all these tools and the libraries, like part libraries that we want people to use, like say we design our 3D printer, we have all these files for a 3D printer construction set. Well, we want people to down to basically download our whole distribution of Linux, so you don't have to download all the different programs from all the different different sites, and there might be some software conflicts. So to eliminate from that from the get-go, because we know that software issues are going to be there, but with this route of doing, what you do here is you download a whole independent distribution of Linux, an open source operating system, you, you put it onto your USB drive and you run off that. It does not change your computer. Everyone has the absolute identical system running. Therefore, no software conflicts, no download issues, none of that. So that's a critical part. If you, if you want a large number of people to collaborate with you seamlessly, eliminate the software-related issues. We're doing that with the OSE Linux Live USB. And we're working on that right now. Requirement number 10. So if you are going to prototype somewhere, so this is for open hardware, somewhere there has to be a build step, and that's the open source microfactory. Just uh, ignore the freak out there. Um, but basically, um, somehow you have to do it here with 3d printing we can you know a lot of people can see how accessible physical prototyping is um, somehow you have to make it easy for people to prototype so 3d printing is one way to do it here's another micro factory that's in nicaragua that has two of our brick presses and four of our power cubes or at least they definitely look like they 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 don't they aren't exactly our model but they seem to be very much like it and I and those units here appear to be power cubes running the machines but this is another uh, micro factory so maybe collaboratively put into to a facility where you can prototype and collaborate now if you don't have a physical facility there are many online services that can do prototyping for you so right now services such as Ponoco 
for um, shapeways or other places you can send digital fabrication files and you can simply outsource the physical manufacturing so for example in our 3d printer example we use a metal frame we get it cut by uh, laser cutting or plasma cutting we just send the file to a, a manufacturer and then we can get a set of frames actually at very competitive cost uh, currently it's we're paying when we outsource for the 3d printer frames right now we're paying fifty dollars per frame though we're looking at actually getting that down to about uh, half of that potentially by wiser design so it's details but yeah you can do various things quite affordably through the internet by sending digital fabrication files to producers okay uh, requirement number 11 in open hardware product development is uh, what I alluded to before and that is 99% of the effort is related to design and 1% is the build in other words focus on the design perfect your instructionals and procedures and simplify the design really put a lot of effort on the design don't just do crap design and then spend all the time building it because you don't have complete documentation you don't have specific parts specified or you're relying on hard to source parts such as going to the junkyard for parts for like one-off pieces of some no design it to be universally manufacturable off from off-the-shelf parts or locally fabricated parts uh, so that you spend a very small portion of your time in the physical prototyping because the physical prototyping part is the part that requires the most effort it's I mean effort as in like you need a physical facility you need materials there's safety issues there's capital for machines and for materials so that's not zero entry level that's there's significant barriers to that so you want to make everything as easy for the fabrication step as possible because most of the costs in terms of like real material costs are coming in at the fabrication step so and the good part is when you design it as such that's where naturally the the extreme manufacturing model arose from that so when, because we make the the build process so efficient we can then invite people to participate in workshops where it's a complete immersion education experience and that's a great way to to do uh, open source product development so just remember most of it is design and then just a little bit of build which m turns a project from something that you have to do at a certain location to a globally distributed wide collaboration process okay next so the next uh, requirement is the distributed enterprise and that is the idea that we're creating enterprises we're developing not only products but enterprises around those products uh, we wrote about it first in uh, MIT innovations journal a few, couple of years ago and um, this is where where we care about mass creation of right livelihoods of people uh, getting involved in production distributing the productivity as far and wide as possible according to principles of Jeffersonian democracy um, distribution of power distribution of wealth all of that by local production therefore right livelihoods because um, if you build the world around you you know that if, if that's more localized then then you can be more responsible for that responsibility is a part of that but also uh, it's not like we're going to be isolationists we, we care about global information flows and global sourcing only if we cannot provide it locally but the point is just about anything can be provided locally if you have rocks sunlight plants soil and water rocks are turned into into steel plants are turned into plastics and rubber you know there's everything is around you just just spend your effort on developing the open source enabling technology so that you don't have to re rely on huge global and irresponsible supply chains that are uh, prone to corruption in the sense that if you have read um, Schumacher's Small is Beautiful, uh, you will know that human organization breaks down after it reaches a certain size. That's just a truism. That's how things work. So we can either work to decrease the size of human organization or to make the huge scale, huge scale operations better. 
well it seems easier to do the the former it's easier to just reduce the scale so that it's everything is more visible more transparent and more direct by by open source that seems to be the winner not like going larger and you know more complex so that um, uh, and still remain extremely efficient and if you go through the numbers you can see that um, the local production is very efficient and we're going to see some some breakthrough numbers like for example comparing tractor production the amount of hours and time and effort it takes us to build a tractor versus say Mahindra and Mahindra the largest tractor manufacturer in the world we're competing with that and we do better than them so I'll that'll be another publication later on we don't have that data specific yet because our tractors are not in the production phase yet so okay but the the distributed enterprise aspect if you want a success, successful open hardware project build in the element of how people can can make money with with your work and if you are opposed to money think about livelihood um, some way to generate value that's real and tangible so livelihood is a huge incentive that's why uh, the freedom to make money is one of the essential freedoms of open source and that's that's so for collaborative literacy you have to understand that um, there's a lot of uh, projects out there that so-called call themselves open source and I won't name any names to not piss people off but a lot of people use the word open source even when their license does not allow um, the use of their stuff for livelihood or commercial needs like you can't sell their stuff well that's not open source so so if they call it open source they're lying uh, the because open source is is not just a uh, a uh, fuzzy word it's a well-defined term defined by the open source initiative and carried on into the open source hardware by the open source hardware association and that's a technical term that that means that the open source has four freedoms one to copy to build upon to make to examine and to sell selling or making a livelihood out of that is important because it's an incentive if you can make a living out of it why wouldn't you get involved especially if it's right livelihood and if it's good for the world and it's collaborative and it's fun and productive that's the way to go so watch out for the the projects that call themselves open source but are not commercial don't allow commercial use for us we're very clear our social contract is based around open source distributed enterprise we're, we're promising to the world that we're producing not only open source design but also open source enterprise documentation so uh, everything that we do we publish openly so that others can benefit learn and replicate okay I'm gonna talk uh, as we wrap up here about the psychology of open source and that's an important one because for collaborative literacy um, you have to be aware that there are certain properties of people that that make people willing to do be open and and I think when I think about this it's actually requires a large amount of maturity on a part of the developer because to me these three are critical to effective open source collaboration and that's esteem vulnerability and a growth mindset so esteem is the only way that you're going to be open to publish your work and open yourself up to critique if you're insecure you're going to be very sensitive to critique and you won't be able to publish openly so and vulnerability like Brene Brown talks about in her well very well received TED talk about vulnerability take a look at that if you haven't seen and Google that um, but vulnerability is that critical aspect of us that allows us to publish early and often we expose ourselves we expose our work we expose stuff that is not complete because we want others to build upon it that's a whole cultural mindset it's of, of vulnerability which means that you have to be a strong person because only strong people can can have the courage to be vulnerable it's about courage and then the last requirement for open source the psychological requirement is is the growth mindset because the way that open source businesses succeed for example spark fun lulzbot osc whoever that is they take the long-term view of constant improvement and not the fact that you develop something and then you protect it like with a patent or with with trade secrets or whatever you're relying on the fact that you know that right now you produce something 
and you're going to produce something even better in the future and you do that constantly without rest so this is not for the ones that want to get grow old and get comfortable this is for people who are constant learners with a growth mindset who are so good and believe that they're going to be good in the future and therefore they don't have to revert to protectionism to make their business succeed they succeed on the mere power and effectiveness and quality of their work and it improves constantly by opening up themselves to others and for feedback they can grow faster better stronger together in my view there is absolutely no comparison between what the growth mindset and an open source product development pipeline can achieve compared to proprietary development no question about it as the problems grow more and more complex you need the growth mindset you need to work with people you need more feedback so to me open source is the next economy it's the next trillion dollar economy and join it be a part of it join us as as on a development team uh, OSE developers I'll put a link below the video if you've got any questions and suggestions let me know below the video and right now I'm gonna open this up uh, I'll finish the presentation this is basically an overview of collaborative literacy what it means to work together truly openly Wow. Um, if I lost anybody, okay, I, I apology, apologies, but yeah, the recording is there. So, so this this video, essentially, this webinar, is um, a brief overview of the various requirements that we found out that work for us at OSC, including the psychological and and so forth. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, please um, write them below the video. Thank you for listening, and we'll take it to the uh, the next webinar in the future. I hope you found something really useful out of this. Uh, I feel like we, we covered a lot of ground here in terms of a lot of the different insights that we have learned, so I'm glad for that, and thank you for listening, and take care.